In August 1967, the move released Flowers in the Rain. It seemed to be a perfect single for the so-called Summer of Love and it reached number two on the UK singles chart. Its release in August of that year coincided with Harold Wilson's Labour government passing of the Marine Offences Act, which effectively made pirate radio stations illegal. Today is the day the singing has to stop. A moment of truth for Britain's pop pirates. Tonight at midnight, the Marine Broadcasting Bill comes into force. Hello, this is Mick Jagger here, and saying hello to Radio London. We're very sad to see you go. We hope to see you one day again. So you've given us a lot of good times. Thank you very much. Big old time is three o'clock, and Radio London is now closing down. Oh, did you hear that? Look, you just heard Radio London go off there. What do you think yes. of it? I think it's ridiculous, Why? really. Well, uh, do you listen well, to it much? Yes. What do you yes, do now? Time. I don't know. I suppose I listen to the BBC instead, you know. I'm not going to listen to BBC because I don't not? plug any good records. Well, now we're going to have to listen to the BBC. It's bound to be dead. Okay, but if not, I don't think it'll be any good. Well, they've got some of the pirate DJs going, I understand. Yeah? yeah. Well, maybe they will then. Give them a try anyway. <laughs> the BBC launched Radio One to meet the demand for music generated by the pirate radio stations and recruited some of the most popular pirate DJs such as Tony Blackburn, Kenny Everett, or John Peel, among others. At the time, the average age of the UK population was 27. Flowers in the Rain achieved its place in pop history by being the first record to be played on Radio One when the station was launched on the 30th of September 1967. Harold Wilson became a hate figure to those disappointed by the close down of the pirate radio stations. The move's manager Tony Secunda was famous for his publicity stunts. Robert Davidson, who was the move's photographer at the time, recalls, His background was promoting wrestling matches. And so he'd come from that and it was bums on seats. He would do anything to get a crowd in. And so every time we went out and did some pictures, he would come out with some extraordinary idea, usually verging on the illegal, immoral or dangerous. The move continued to court controversy under the direction of Tony Secunda, but a promotional postcard printed and distributed by the manager without their knowledge would land them in bigger trouble than ever before. The offending postcard advertised the release of the move's third single Flowers in the Rain. It featured a cartoon of the then Prime Minister Harold Wilson, discovered by his wife in a compromising position with his secretary Marcia Williams. He had a thousand of these postcards done, and then he said, right, how are we going to distribute them, Robert? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And he said, well, let's go and find the most famous politician we can who lives locally. So we went in search of a gentleman called Michael Foote, who lived in um, Hampstead then. So we went and stalked him and went up to him and said, could you take these into the House of Parliament and distribute them amongst all the other politicians? And he said, well... And Tony said, go on, you can do it, Michael. And he said, well, yeah, I'll do that for you. And anyway, he went off with them. And Tony also sent them to anybody he could think of, any journalist going, TV and did that without the move knowing what was going on the band hadn't got a clue next day newspaper headlines read pop band sued by prime minister for libel trevor burton the moves guitarist remembered we were playing down south somewhere i can't remember which gig but we came out of the gig and it was like being elizabeth taylor or somebody you know there's like it must have been 100 photographers and flash bulbs going off and we didn't know why and one of them, the guys said, oh, you've been sued by the Prime Minister. We said, what? <laughs> <laughs> the Prime Minister sued, serving the group with an interim injunction and the whole thing went to court a couple of months later on October 11th, 1967. The following day, there was a knock on the door about nine o'clock in the morning and these two gentlemen said, Tony Secunda? And he said, yes. And he said he's never been that frightened ever in his life. They had him up against the wall very rapidly and frightened him saying you've been very naughty you've upset the prime minister harold wilson and threatened tony and said listen don't ever do that again and then they put him down gently and and walked away and he rang me later and said robert I, they frightened me i think this one might get a bit bigger on the day of the court case quinton hogg qc acted for harold wilson ironically he had been the man who spread the rumors about wilson's affair with his secretary in the first place alluding to them in Parliament some three years earlier. 
Tony Secunda had hired a Rolls-Royce for the day, which had broken down on the M1 on its way down from Birmingham. They were running late and had missed the proceedings. Carl Wayne was holding a book by Timothy Leary, Turn on, Tune in Drop Out. Acid had arrived. Asked about their political standpoint, they joked, we have, we have no faith in any political sides at all. We vote for people like Frank Zappa, Jimi Hendrix, you know, and, you know any, anybody. The court found Tony, the publisher, the cartoonist, Neil Smith, the band and anybody else involved guilty. Quinton Hogg described the postcard as scurrilous, making use of malicious rumours concerning the Prime Minister's character and integrity. He also criticised the decision to send it to journalists, television producers and music publishers. The band were ordered to apologise to the Prime Minister for spreading false and malicious rumours concerning his character and to pay all profits from the single flowers in the rain to charities of Wilson's choosing, including Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where Jimmy Savile was jolly busy, and the Spastic Society, now called Scope. The royalties for both the A and B sides of the record were to be paid in perpetuity, forever. This agreement would cost the band more dearly than they could have imagined. At the time, lost revenue was estimated at anything from £2,000 to £8,000. Twenty years after the event, Roy Wood complained that he was losing hundreds of thousands of pounds. By now, it is estimated that he could have lost millions in royalties. The band were already divided over Secunda's tactics, but the court case created a rift that never healed. The move seemed poised for bigger and better things and the big stars of the time were taking notice. In an interview that year, Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones said, I'd like to see the move, they are really an extension of our idea of smashing conventions. Those kind of smash-ups they have, destroying TVs, cars and all that, are all part of dissatisfaction with convention. Paul McCartney reviewed their I Can Hear the Grass Grow single for Melody Maker and said, I haven't actually seen him live or anything but the reports I hear are very good. They sound good, they look good. It just depends how they're handled in the meantime and how they look after themselves. Pete Townsend from The Who was also aware of the move. I've liked what I've heard about them and what they do, he said. I think they've got the same sort of following that we used to have in old marquee club days. And that's the kind of fans that they deserve, the best, faithful. According to photographer Robert Davidson, They were this brilliant band who then slowly, bit by bit, started to sort of, chunks started to fall off. Secunda left. Um, the producer fell away. Ace Kefford, who was a paranoid person at the best of times, wonderful musician and a fantastic icon, but he crumbled under the strain of um, the fallout of the court case. The blonde, beautiful, weak link in the chain is kind of the one who's the sacrificial lamb, and poor old Ace, he was the one who fell in spring 68 and ended up in a mental hospital. Tempted to bait controversy further with Cherry Blossom Clinic, a song about a mental institution, it was felt that the B-side, Vote For Me, was one dig at Wilson and the political establishment too far. The planned single was cancelled, together with the move's contract with Tony Secunda. Remember, we were only kids, we really yeah. were, and we were terrified. James Bond movies were very big at the time, and yeah. we swear that there were Secret Service guys, and we even thought they'd be like, you know, we could be shot, we could be picked off by a <laughs> sniper or something. We, we were pretty scared, we were kids from Birmingham, down in London. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, we were being pursued by all the paparazzi. You've been sued by one of the most powerful men in the world. Yeah. And, and we were just like lambs to the slaughter, really. We didn't know what the hell was going on. 